We're going to start off today with a review, and um, we're going to, we talked about, we've been talking about reading the Word, daily reading of the Word, and the importance of that in the, in the life of the believer. I've talked about how it's transformed my life. I mean, it really has. Right, right when I became a believer, I had a deep desire, a deep hunger to read the Word of God. It was, just, it was just in me. I didn't know. I, didn't, I was asking people a lot of questions. I was, um, where should I read? And, and I, I developed a, right off the bat, I developed a, a relationship with the Word of God. And I'm very thankful for that. That's one of the foundations the Lord had in my life. And I've seen a lot of believers that that's not a foundation in their life. And I'm not saying, well, I, I'm up here. And I'm not saying that in, in the least. I'm just saying how much of an impact it makes reading the Word and, and, the, and, the, and the benefit it makes. And it's never too late to start. If you're alive today, you can start reading the word. <laughs> you can start and just and just see that transformation take place. Um, we talked about this, the parable of the sower, and and we we emphasized two of the soils. We kind of talked about the stony places and the thorns, but we talked a lot about the um, the the wayside when this when the sower went out to sow seeds. Some fell by the wayside. I don't think the sower. It says some fell by the wayside. I don't think the sower was intentionally sowing by on the wayside, okay? I don't think it was, a, it was an intentional thing because um, a lot of times people just aren't ready to hear. They're just not, I mean, yes, we preach the word of God, but sometimes people are just very resistant of the word. I was for years. But anyway, <clears throat> people who hear on the wayside are people who um, hear the word but don't think about it, okay? They just hear it as sound. They can hear the word of God and it's just a sound to them. It's just like hearing just some ran- somebody say random things. Why? Because they didn't think about it. Okay, um, Jesus talked about, he said in Luke, I believe it was chapter 8, he said, take heed how you hear. Meaning there's different ways of hearing. I love it. Jesus even said one time, um, talking about when he was going to um, be crucified and raised from the dead, he said, let this saying sink deep into your ears. That's profound. I forget exactly where that's at, but I've always remembered that. He said, let this saying, he said, what I'm about to say, let it sink deep into your ears. And and so when you you hear something and think about it, you're letting it sink in. When you hear the word of God, the word of God is the best thing you can think about. The absolute best thing you could possibly set your mind to. Better than anything, infinitely better. So when you're thinking on the word, you're allowing it to sink in. We talked about that. When you don't think on the word, the enemy can steal it. We talked about how when the seed fell on the wayside, it was on top, right? It was very visible to the birds because it didn't sink in, and the enemy just came and just snatched it, right? So if you hear the word and don't think about it, I mean, this is for believers and non-believers alike. I believe this parable applies to believers and non-believers. It's it's a vast parable. Um, But when when you hear the word and just don't think on it, the enemy has the ability to take it. But when you allow it to sink in, he can't. You can't take what's been sown in your heart, okay? So the more you think on the word, the deeper it goes like a seed. We talked about that. We just gave you a very, very simple picture. Um, imagine the soil right here, the word, the seed of God. As you think on it, think on it, think on it, think on it, it goes deeper, deeper, deeper into the soil. Then it begins to grow roots. It can be, I mean, it begins to germinate first, then it grows roots, then it sprouts, then it grows fruit, okay? Jesus talks about <clears throat> the, that process as well, I believe, in uh, somewhere in Mark. <laughs> Um, then we talked about things that happen when you take in the word. I mean, it's amazing. When you just sit down to, think, to, to read the word and then think about it, peace begins to flow. It's amazing. For one thing, you're not thinking about your problem when you're reading the word, when you're thinking on the word. You can actually be reading the word and thinking about something else. How many of you have ever done that? You've read something, you're reading something, and you're thinking about something else. That's very possible. I've done that many times. But... If you read it and think about it, peace begins to actually flow. It's amazing. Just peace. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going through, peace begins to to rise up as you're reading the word. Life begins to, life and health. And we talked about that last week. It's like, reading the word produces health? Think of it like like when when you're eating right and you're exercising, all that kind of makes you physically healthy. Well, reading the Word, and it's not a work, but when you're reading the Word, it's actually releasing life. It really is. Because Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4 says that, that His Word is life and health to all our flesh. 
Okay, so when you're taking in his word, you are literally releasing life and health into all your flesh. Does everyone believe that? That's what the word says. I believe it. I believe it. It's, it's very, very powerful. Um, and another thing that you're doing is when you're, when you're thinking on the word, you are in relation. That's part of relationship with God. Okay, because these are his thoughts. It says that all scripture is God-breathed or inspired of God. So these are his thoughts. Men that wrote this were inspired by the Holy Spirit. When you're thinking on his thoughts, that's intimacy with God. You're thinking about his thoughts. And isn't that what relationship is about? A big part of relationship? So you're, you're literally having relationship with God as you, as you think on the word, as you meditate on the word. So we're, we're definitely going to continue with this, and we're going to do that today um, by thinking on his word. Really, we're going to do kind of like another commentary kind of um, look at Psalm 103, because as um, Leslie gave me that sheet about Psalm 103 to, to what we were going to do today, I really started meditating on it. And then I remembered I prepared a sermon on Psalm 103, like um, maybe five months ago, but I got caught up in one of my reviews and when it wasn't able to do it. <laughs> and when I do that sometimes, sometimes it's, I, I think it's just a point that the Holy Spirit wants to emphasize, wants to get home. Um, but I prepared it and I reworked it and it's just, uh, it really blessed me to just really, to, to really get into Psalm 103 because it's such a powerful, such a powerful prophetic uh, uh, um, chapter about grace. I mean, it's just pure grace. Some of the Psalms are very, can be very depressing. You know, David talking about, oh, you know, God, my enemies are going to kill me. Why are you against me? That, you know, David he can whine a lot in the Psalms. But this Psalm, and so all the Psalms are good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> all the Psalms are good. But a lot of the Psalms are, are, are portrayed David's situation because he's the major writer of the Psalms. There are different writers. Um, he it portrays his situation and him crying out to God the way he feels. And that's, that's perfectly fine. God wants us to be real. But this Psalm is pure, I mean, I believe a pr- prophecy of the new covenant of grace. Okay, so we're going to look at it today. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 103 because we're going to go over a big Big chunk of it. Hopefully, we might be able to cover all of it. I don't know. But um, the first thing we're going to start with is uh, Psalm 103.1. And it says, uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So a lot of times we think that God blesses us. This is one of the few times in the Bible where it says for us to bless the Lord. Okay? We, we, we do read a lot. We do hear a lot. You know, God bless us. God bless America, God bless this, God bless that, God, God bless you when you sneeze. <laughs> but this is saying, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all right? So we can bless him with our soul and, and with all that is within us. It's differentiating our soul and all that is within us. What is your soul? It's your mind, will, and emotions. So you're making, you're making an effort, you're, 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 it's an act of your will to bless him. You don't have to. You absolutely do not have to, but you can. And all that is within you. Psalm 103, 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's, there's so much in there. Forget not. Why does it say forget not? Because we're prone to forgetting. If we always remembered his benefits, it wouldn't have said that. But we always forget. Why? Because of circumstances. A lot of times the circumstances get in the way, and we'll forget. And it says all. All. You know what that word all in the Hebrew means? All. <laughs> That's what uh, Andrew Walmack always used to do that to us at, at Bible college. You know that word? Because he'd always use like Greek and Hebrew words and he'd always get us with that. But it means all. Forget not all his benefits. All right? So, <clears throat> how do, so it's saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. So it's like, how do I bless him? How do I bless him? By not forgetting his benefits. That's how you bless him. See, that's a lot of times we will think, well, how, how, I got to bless God. I have no idea how to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best, you know, I'll try my best to bless him. But it says very clearly right here, blessing him is not forgetting his benefits. I'll give you an example. Is God blessed when you receive Jesus? Is he blessed? Yes, it says that he rejoices with the angels, right? It's very blessed. <laughs> It, it, yeah, it, it's the best thing for him. Absolutely, the best thing when someone receives Jesus. So you bless him by remembering what he's done for you. Isn't that good? 
Isn't that really good? That's what this is saying. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And, and, and we bless him in, in different ways as well. We worship him, but it all comes from seeing what he's done for us. That's the relationship that he wants out of us, is acknowledging what he's done. He's the provider. He's our source. Okay? We're the receivers of love. And then all we'll do is just give it right back to him. Okay? So, Psalm 102, we bless the Lord by not forgetting his benefits. It blesses him when you acknowledge all he's done for us. He blesses us with his benefits. Okay? And this is benefits. It's everything he's provided. His grace, his salvation, his healing, his peace, his life. He blesses us with his benefits. It blesses him when we acknowledge his benefits. Went over that. And it says forget not because we will forget a lot of times. A lot of Christians forget. We have to keep these things in our minds, okay? It's very important to, to meditate on what he's done for us. When you think on what he's done for us, it actually, um, and in Proverbs it does say, I believe it's 20, Proverbs 22, 3, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So as you, as you think on the goodness and, and, and grace of God that he's provided, you will literally release those things into your life. Okay, those things will be, be manifested, so to speak. Not forgetting his benefits is the only thing that, that, that it says to do here, right? That's, that's our part. Okay, when we, we bless the Lord by not forgetting his benefits, and then it goes over some of his benefits, and that's what we're going we're gonna to look at. But... It's not saying to do a whole lot here, is it? It says just don't forget. That's it. Don't forget. Bless him and don't forget. So that's our, that's our God. That's the grace of our God. Don't forget his benefits. Okay? <clears throat> it doesn't tr say try your hardest to get his benefits. Not forgetting his benefits is the only thing we have to do. All right? In this situation. And like I've said time and time again, when we acknowledge his benefits and what he's done, that's what empowers us to live this life. That's what empowers us to be the Christians, the children that he's created. Okay, first comes from him. We're, grace, grace, does, it's, there's so many facets of grace, but one of the major facets of grace is empowerment. It, grace, one of the definitions for grace is God's ability, okay, so we, we need to look at that. Well, Psalm 103.3, it says, uh, who forgives all. It's, a saying, it's saying the word all. It, it says the word all a lot in this chapter. Forgives all your iniquities. Notice it didn't say sins. I found that interesting. The Bible actually differentiates iniquities, transgression, and sin. And there's, 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 that's a whole study to do. But it says iniquity here. And iniquity, this word in, in the Hebrew means perversion. That's literally what it means, perversion. And, and it says <clears throat> iniquity is an, in, it's, I like to explain it like this. Iniquity is what causes you to do the physical act of sin. Like, for example, if in my heart, if I'm thinking on why I really want to steal Ken's car, and I, I just might do it, you know. <laughs> I really, man, Ken's, Ken's car is nice. You know, it's probably good, you know, I'm just thinking on it and thinking about how I want to steal it. See, that's the iniquity, and then the sin would be actually stealing his car, the physical act of stealing his car. And it says he forgives the root of sin. See, that's powerful. Forgives the iniquity, the perversion, what causes us to sin. See, see that, that's, that's, and I encourage you to study that out, um, but he forgives all our iniquity, the perversion, the root of sin, who heals all, there's that word all again. And what does that mean in the Hebrew? Oh, we've got some Hebrew scholars here. <laughs> who forgives all, I mean, who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all our diseases. All of them, okay? Well, some of you need to say, well, I still have some sickness. Well, he hasn't healed all my diseases. That's a clear indication, and I say this for myself as well, okay? Where, where, where we have to remember his benefits. Remember his benefits. Remember, it doesn't simply mean just to recall on occasion. This remember means to, to ponder on, to think on, to keep in the mind. Remember, 
All right, to, uh, it's, it's different than, than remembering like, hey, you remember that one time we went fishing? Yeah, I remember it, and then just move on. No, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset, his benefits. Just meditating on this verse alone, he heals all my diseases. I'm remembering your benefits, Lord, thinking on it. And what does it say when you think on the word? Romans 8, 6, for the mindset in the flesh is death, but the mindset in the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. And it says the word of God is living and active. You're, when you think on this word, it's alive and it's active. It's actively producing in your life. So who heals all our diseases, okay? And, it, and this word heals means cure. It, he's not just like a remedy. There's a difference between a remedy, a quick fix, things like that. He is the cure, your absolute cure. All right, when, when you're cured of something, it doesn't mean it's going to keep attacking you, keep coming back. You are cured. He is your cure. All right? So Psalm 103, 4, he, he redeems your life from destruction. Okay, this word redeems here means to buy back. Okay, Adam sold us into death. He did. He sold us into death, sold us in the hands of the enemy. But Jesus bought us back. He redeems our life from destruction. How did he redeem our life from destruction? By taking on our destruction. That's what he did. That's how he, he, he bought us back, by taking on our, our destruction, our, our, our failure, our sin, our sickness. Okay, and then I, I love this. <laughs> I really do. It says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. That is powerful. God crowns us. How many of you ever cr gave a crown to your children? How many have ever done that? Not one of you. <laughs> God does that to his children. He crowns you. That's powerful. That is very, very powerful. What is a crown? What, what does a crown really signify and, and represent? It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a show of position. That's what it is. We all think of crowns as royalty and things like that. It's a show of position. And that's what God has, has, he has crowned you with his love. And so many Christians are walking around not knowing that they're wearing a crown of his love. That, that, and and I, I, for years, I was walking, how could you walk around depressed and sad and downtrodden with a crown of his, his loving kindness and tender mercies on your head? How could you? By simply not knowing it's there. Is it there in the physical right now? No, it's not. I, I can't physically see any crowns on your heads. But in the spirit, in the spirit realm, all of us who have received Jesus are wearing a crown of loving kindness and tender mercies. It's, it's on top of our head. God sees it. God sees it. It's like, my, there's my daughter. There's my son. They have a crown of loving kindness, my crown of loving kindness. It's very powerful to think about, to think he crowns us. We think of ourselves as these lowly sinners, you know, a lot of times that, that God should punish and, and you know, he's, he's almighty God. You know, we think, we kind of get that mindset. But to think that he, he crowns us, it even says in Revelation that we are kings and priests, that's powerful to think about. Many believers will fight that. I'm not a king and a priest. No way. I, I can barely live this life. But you know what? When you receive Jesus, the lowliest believer, the, the lowliest believer is a king and a priest. See, under the new covenant, the king, the, 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 the king and the priest, the priesthood were separated, and they couldn't do one another's jobs. They couldn't. Even Saul, the king of Israel, got in trouble for doing the, the job of the priest. He was, he was going, they were going to war and he was going to um, light some incense and he did and he, this leprosy came on him. He wasn't supposed to do that. But now under the new covenant, now we are a king and a priest. That's powerful. That's powerful to think about. So, <clears throat> the word says you are crowned with love. So if the word says it, is it true? Amen. Amen. It is very true. Uh, Psalm 103.5, who satisfies you, okay? Psalm 103.5, who satisfies your mouth 
with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There's that word satisfies. We've been talking a lot about that lately. Only God can satisfy. See, man was not created to satisfy himself and man was not created to satisfy other man. Okay? Only God can truly satisfy. That's it. Only God. So you'll notice <clears throat> people who are seeking satisfaction from themselves or other people or other things, things of this world, or they're seeking satisfaction from anything but God, they age very fast. They do. They just, you, can, you can see it a lot of times in people. They're just like, wow, you're really burnt out. You're really kind of down. But when God is our satisfaction, our youth is renewed like the eagles. That's what the word says. It's renewed like the eagles. So, <clears throat> Psalm 103, 6, it says, The Lord execute righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. And, and, and this is, of course, under the, under the old covenant. Now under the new covenant, he has given us his righteousness and judged our oppressor. Jesus even said about Satan, he said, Satan, the ruler of this world, talking about Satan, has already been judged. Okay, so God, what, what Jesus did, he came and gave us his righteousness and judged our oppressor. Satan already has judgment on him. His judgment is already fulfilled. There's no redemption, okay, for him. There is redemption for us, praise God. So, <clears throat> Psalm 103, 7, uh, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And I got to thinking about that. Ways and acts. Why, why did it say ways to Moses, but acts to the children of Israel? And then I got to thinking about Moses and what he did. He prayed this. He said, Lord, uh, uh, in, in Ex Exodus 33, he said, Lord, show me now your way that I may know you and find grace in your sight. So he prayed to know God, know his way. The children of Israel didn't. They actually ran from God a lot of times. They complained against God. They did a lot of things that indicated they did not want relationship with God. A lot of times or when God came to, um, I, I forget exactly where this is. It's, I, think it's in, I think it's in Exodus. But when God, God came to, to show himself and to draw the children of Israel near, they were like, no, no, like, we can't take the sound of his voice. We, we can't. Even when Moses came off the mountain with the glory shining, they were like, put a veil on his face. He's, we can't take this. So there was a lot of kind of rejection from the children of Israel. But Moses was like, hey, I want to know you. I want to know you. All right, so it says he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. <clears throat> ways are why you do something. Acts are simply what you did. See, his acts he definitely made known to the children of Israel. He, he, he I mean, they saw his acts, the parting of the Red Sea, all the miracles, the manna from heaven, the, the quail that came, different things like that. But his ways are why he did something. So Moses knew his ways. And now, us as believers, we know his way. What is his way? Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way. He is the way. So now we know his way, not just his acts. Psalm 103, 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. I like that. It says merciful and gracious. And this, is, this might be a, um, a little bit of a kind of a brain twister, but just bear with me. When it says merciful, it means he's not giving us what we deserve. What do we deserve? Death and hell. That's what we deserve. Okay, compared to God's holiness, we deserve to go to hell. All of us, every human. So mercy, when it says we were on us, uh, was I on eight? Yeah, the Lord is merciful. That is not getting what we deserve. And it says, and gracious. That is him giving us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve all of his benefits, do we? We don't. We don't deserve all of the healing and all of the peace. We don't deserve it. But that's why it says, he is merciful, one, that's one thing, and gracious. If, if they were both the same thing, they would have just said one word. But see, a lot of times we confuse mercy with grace. We really do. We think grace is God's mercy. It's not. It's not. The cross was God's mercy. The resurrection was God's grace. He gave us his grace, okay, to overcome. So, Psalm 103.9, <clears throat> it says, 
He will not always strive. This word means to, to have controversy with. It also means to actually grapple. That's one of the Hebrew meanings, to grapple, to wrestle. He will not always strive or fight, for lack of better terms, fight with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Uh, verse 10 Okay, well, I want, verse 9, it says, He will not always strive with us nor keep his anger forever. So if it says he will not always, this would indicate at some time he did strive with man, right? He did have anger towards man. It says he won't always keep it. And we see that time and time again throughout the Old Testament. God did fight with man. They did fight with one another. I mean, there was, a, there was like maybe like a rebellious teenager and a um, parent, you know, kind of like, Maybe like that scenario. And he would punish them a lot. He really would. But it says he won't always do that forever. Why? It, does, it, doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean he's going to give up his justice. It doesn't mean he's not going to punish sin, because that's what God was doing. It's not like he enjoyed punishing the children of Israel for punishment's sake, but he had to punish sin. He had to. He's God. He's just. He's holy. So, the answer is in Psalm 103.10. We're going to read that. I think that's the last verse we're going to be able to go over today. Psalm 103.10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. See how it differentiates sins and iniquities? They're two different words. Sin and iniquity are two different things. So, pop quiz. This is a pop quiz. Okay? And, and if you pass, if you know we don't pass, I'm going to lock that door, and no one's leaving until you pass. <laughs> iniquities. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus, you all pass. Praise God. That's why. Okay? Ver verse 10, he has not dealt with us according to our sins because he dealt with Jesus according to our sins. Okay? Nor punish us according to our iniquities. Why? Because he punished Jesus. He punished Jesus for our iniquities. So now he won't do it to us because he already did it to Jesus. It's like double jeopardy. Um, you can't get, you can't get uh, convicted for the same crime twice in America, right? You can't. So if God were to say, you know what? I want to look at what you did last year, and I want to punish you for it. That'd be double jeopardy. He isn't going to do that, because you, know you know what? Jesus already paid for it. He, already, he was already punished, as if he did it. That's why it's, he won't always strive with man, because Jesus made peace, peace, with God and with man. He's our mediator. Praise God. So that's our message for today. Praise God, I got to finally finish the Psalm 103 message. I encourage you just to meditate on that this upcoming week. Forget not his benefits. Keep them in your mind. All right, and that's when, when you actually remember his benefits, when you're thinking about his benefits, that's when they actually happen. It's up to you to think on them and speak them. It's up to you to meditate on them. All these things are readily available. All of the word of God is readily available to you. All it takes is thinking on it. Just like thinking on the problem actually will cause more problems, think of it the same way, okay? <laughs> think of it the same exact way. Now I'm going to, we're gonna go right into the offering. I'm gonna just talk about the offering and do the offering prayer, and then we're gonna do the offering. And um, like we talked about last week, actually, in 2 Corinthians, um, it, it says that, um, um, talking about giving, it says, don't give grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's what we talked about last week. And giving is, is really comes from just imitating our Father, because guess what? He is, he is the giver, right? He gave us everything, everything he had. Jesus was everything he had was his everything, because it was himself, okay? Jesus even said, he said, I can do nothing unless I see my Father doing it. That's, I take that literally, okay? I take that very literally. He even said, I can hear nothing, I can say nothing unless I hear my Father saying it. All right, so a lot of times we think of when Jesus went to the cross and everything, there was this major, God had to turn his back on Jesus because he can't look on sin. You know, it doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture that God turned his back on Jesus. The reason why we get that is because it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I believe truly that God was right there while Jesus was on the cross because who else was going to put the sin of the world on him? Who else was going to put wrath on him? He could have done that while his back, when he's just kind of like, 
he, it says that he was crushing him and bruising him. It says that he was placing wrath on him and iniquity. God was right there doing it to him. So he, it wasn't like he was off somewhere. I, I don't know where people get that. I don't know exactly where because it's not coming from the word. But he was right there putting it all on Jesus. And, and where, am I, where am I exactly going with this? He did that. He gave that. He gave Jesus and then did that to Jesus for you, for me. Okay? So when we look at that, when we see that, instead of looking at, gosh, I got to give, or gosh, I got to witness to this person, or gosh, I... When you do that, you'll, just, you'll have no strength to do anything. If you do, it'll be out of your own strength, and that's dead. But when you look at what he did for you, that empowers you. Okay, so, I, so I, that's my main emphasis right now is look at what he's done for you before you even consider giving. Just thank you, Jesus, for, for what you've done for me, for everything that you've given me, for the grace that you've lavished on my life. See, what you're doing is you're taking your mind off of yourself and putting it on him. And that's when you're able to do, okay? And you'll be a cheerful giver. You'll, you'll want to give. You'll have a desire to give. When there's a demand to give, when there's a demand, a lot of times people will give, but it's out of guilt. God doesn't want that. What does it say? He wants a cheerful giver. So take the demand off to give. There is no more demand to give. There is not a demand to give. But when you look at what he's done for you, there's a desire to give, a desire. And how many of you know, how, how many of you know that desire is better than de demand? Because desire has to do with your will, a willingness. Demand has to do with slavery. You're no longer slaves. You're no longer slaves. You're children. And now you're servants, children and servants. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to um, pass, pass around while we're doing the music. Okay, well, Father, we just thank you right now for, for your word. Thank you that we do not have, we, we can remember all of your benefits. We've, I thank you that each one of us here will forget not all your benefits. Thank you that you forgive all our iniquity. You heal all our diseases. You redeemed our life from destruction. And you've crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies. And thank you right now, Father God, that each one of us here will meditate on that and think on that and release your life and your peace. And thank you, Lord, that we are able to give. We take the demand off to give. And we thank you that you produce a desire to give, to sow into your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, that we can continue to worship here and be a blessing to you in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name.